All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Tim Potter, and this uh, this is intended as a as a sort of a beginner introduction to Solar Cloud. Uh, so before we kind of dive in, I'd like to get a feel of the uh, of the audience. Um, how many people now are running Solar but not in Solar Cloud mode? Just show me your hand. Okay, good. And actually, how many are uh, using Solar Cloud? Okay, great. So this should be a really good talk. Um, my intent really is to basically uh, cover a lot of the base um, sort of topics and thinking that's in Solar Cloud to kind of give you a sense of the technology. Uh, I know this is a little bit of old school sort of uh, tag cloud uh, from the mid 2000s or whatever, but the the key takeaway on this slide really for me is like there is a lot to take in with, with a distributed system, um, and Solar Cloud's no different. So there there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of uh, uh, sort of terms that you think you understand, but maybe not quite in Solar Cloud. So uh, I just want to throw this up there that like at the end of this talk, I hope some of that stuff <laughs> is clear to you. Um, so my background. Basically, right now I work at uh, Lucid Works with Chris, who just gave the talk. Steve, uh, I try to focus on Solar Cloud as much as possible, and currently I'm, I'm kind of working on a project where we're uh, we're trying to test Solar Cloud uh, in, in, in a pretty large scale, like uh, getting towards five, six billion documents, uh, not counting replication, in you know a 200 or larger node cluster, and we're doing that in Amazon, and so we're you know trying to um, I'm one of the team members working on that and trying to really scale up Solar Cloud and find find out where uh, where it breaks down, where things need to be improved. Be before this, uh, I was at a company called the Dotchess Group, where I was sort of the chief operator and developer and designer of a Solar Cloud cluster in Amazon. Uh, we had about 36 nodes and supported close to a billion documents. Uh, we ended up scaling that back a bit because of some of the complex analytical queries we had required too much RAM for that many docs. Um, but so I do have experience sort of operating cluster, working on it and that sort of thing. Um, currently, I have been working as much as I can, probably not as much as Mark would like, uh, to uh, contribute and, and actually work on the Solar Cloud code base. Uh, it's really awesome and there's a lot there to learn, so I'm kind of doing, doing that as much as I can with Lucid works, and then also tomorrow I'm going to be giving a talk on a framework uh, I worked on. It's uh, based on Fabric. It's a Python library uh, for actually managing a solar cloud cluster. So if you're interested in the sort of operations side of all this, and it's a lot more than just spinning up a cluster. You know, we do backup, restore, we do all kinds of different things. So I'll be talking about that tomorrow. And then also I was a co-author of Solar in Action and actually wrote the, the chapter on solar cloud. <clears throat> Okay, so before we kind of get into how things work, let's make sure we understand what Solar Cloud is. Uh, this is my own uh, definition, kind of makes sense to me, but it's a, it's a, it's a subset of features in Solar uh, that are optional. You don't, you're not forced to run Solar Cloud if it doesn't work for you. Uh, it's really enable and simplify horizontal scaling. Okay, so we're not talking about buying more RAM or faster disk, but actually scaling out by adding more nodes using sharding and replication. Um, so that's a lot to kind of take in, and after this talk, I hope you have a pretty good understanding of how it goes about that. Some of the goals, obviously scalability. We're in this era of big data, um, and uh, you know my data is bigger than your data. So scalability is kind of the chief goal, but <clears throat> um, some of these other goals that I think are just important are like performance. Solar and Lucene, kind of their success, really at the end of the day, um, can be attributed really to how fast they are. I mean, I am amazed how fast Solar and Lucene are still, just in standalone mode. Um, and I think one of the goals of Solar Cloud is that they don't lose that. Like, oh, it's great to distribute, but now it becomes slow. No, it wants to stay as performant as possible. Another goal as well. You can have big data, but if you lose half your nodes and, and you lose that data, then you really have achieved nothing. So high availability, ensuring that when bad things do happen, your system stays operable. Um, another one that's sort of more of a work in progress, but still very important to me and uh, to, to the rest of the solar community is actually making all of this simple, right? And simple is kind of a vague term. 
a lot like Haas's support. Simple can mean, you know, it's easy to get started with and understand. But also could be simple if something goes bad, how do I recover from that? Is it some sort of like all night affair or is there actually a simple path to recovery? And those sort of things. So, so simple it means a lot of different things in Solar Cloud, but I think it's definitely one of the main goals in a lot of the design decisions is to actually make this system simple. And then the last is um, pretty much most people, when they're especially working with a system like Solar Cloud, uh, their data is always growing, right? It's becoming more complex and those kind of things. So elasticity in this case is kind of more in one direction. Like you have to support more users and more documents and add more servers. So um, really, Solar Cloud, I think, does a really good job, even though elasticity is not in its name. It's actually very elastic in terms of growing and scaling sort of as solar succeeds and becomes more and more important in your organization. And then lastly, this is just one to keep in the back of your head, is that this is still really an evolving system. Um, and uh, so one of the things I see is like people have installed four or five, and then that's what they're going with. They're not upgrading, you know. And I, I think you have to keep in mind that it's like try to stay up to date. So enough said about that. <clears throat> here are some of the terms. This slide isn't really meant to be read. It's here for reference, so I'll, I'll just keep going on. Let's talk about sort of the high-level architecture of Solar Cloud, and there's a lot going on in this diagram, so don't worry if, if you can't see it, if you're in the back or whatever, but uh, some of the key takeaways here is uh, throughout this talk, I'm actually gonna use a, an example of, of a collection we're gonna build, uh, a search index we're, we're gonna build. It's called Log Stash for Solar, and this is actually a log aggregation tool. It's actually a real project uh, that uh, LucidWorks, the company I work for, sponsors. And so the idea is that we have all these applications in our organization. We want to aggregate their logs into a search index so we can do analytics, queries, and that type of thing on top of it. So one of the key takeaways here is we have four solar nodes in our cluster. And looking just at the top row there, what we have are these two nodes. And the index itself, log stash for solar, is sharded. And on the top row, we have shard one. And we have a leader and a replica. And so what's happening here is that as, index, as documents are indexed, they come into, say, shard one, and then it immediately replicates those documents uh, to its replica. And you can have as many replicas in a shard as you want. Um, looking more at the sort of the two rows here, we have this index log stash for solar split into two shards, right? Shard one and shard two. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why you shard and, and how to shard and that kind of thing. And then also the other thing to keep in mind is that Solar Cloud is based on a technology called Zookeeper, which provides a lot of the key sort of um, distributed coordination and uh, centralized configuration management services for Solar Cloud. When you're first starting out, and we're gonna do this for the log stash for Solar, is you actually have uh, in Solar Cloud this concept of a collection, okay? And, yeah, it, a lot of you have actually worked with solar in standalone mode. Um, so uh, an index on a standalone server is a core. Right? That shouldn't be um, uh, too unfamiliar to you. Well, a collection, we didn't want to use the, core, the overload the core tomb too much. So a collection is actually a, in a distributed index that's spread across multiple nodes. And it has a couple key, key properties. Um, one is it has a name configuration. And I'll, and I'll get into that more in a second. Uh, but that's like your solarconfig.xml, stop word, schema, that sort of thing. Collection also has a number of shards, okay? And that's where you've decided we're gonna split this index into sort of n partitions, right? And when you create a collection, you actually have to set the number of shards, okay? And that becomes a pretty important decision. Um, uh, as Chris mentioned, we can split shards and things, and I'll get into that, but when you're first starting out, you have to set the number of shards for a collection, and it can just be one, or it can be many. Some of the testing we're doing, we're like working with collections that have like 50 shards, you know, and billions of documents, and see how that works. Um, so now that we have shards, we have to have a way to figure out where um, a document gets routed to which shards, because there's no overlap of documents and shards. So when a document comes in for indexed, it has to decide, the Solar Cloud has to decide which shard that belongs to, and that comes in this document routing strategy. And there are actually a couple different document stra routing strategies available to you based on um, some, of you, some 
some of your business requirements. And then lastly, there's the replication factor. And this is how many copies of each document exist in your index, okay? Um, so a replication factor of three would mean there are three copies of every document in your index. So if you have 100 million documents, in, in reality, with a replication factor of three, you would have 300 million documents in your cluster in this collection. To support collections, Solar has a collections API. Um, it's basically, you know, just like any uh, API, you just send in a request with your parameters. So here is where we are creating our log, log stash for Solar collection. So let me do a quick demo. Um, we'll see how quick this is, but I think this is important for a couple reasons. One is I want you to actually see Solar Cloud run, and then the other is to see that, you know, uh, it really is um, pretty simple to get started and actually um, kind of see it work. And we're gonna index some docs, run some queries, knock over a node, uh, see, see the uh, cluster recover from that and that kind of thing. So first thing I'm gonna do is find my start command. Okay, so I'm gonna start up uh, four nodes, and this is the first one. Sorry about it being at the bottom there. Basically, uh, the only thing that's really that important right now is that this guy's running on that port on my local box, 8984, and I'm passing this flag, ZK run. What ZK run says is um, I wanna embed Zookeeper into this solar as a kind of an embedded server. Um, solar cloud, becomes activated by telling Solar, here's a zookeeper that you connect to, and that's all there is to it. In this case, instead of starting up my own zookeeper, I'm just gonna run it in Solar, which is kind of the good demo out of the box experience. Cool, so we'll start that guy up, hopefully. And then, now I'm gonna start the other servers, the other four servers, so the other ones start in the background. On this line, the key thing that's important is, again, it's on a different port, and then I'm passing ZK host. Well, remember, I started the other one in, in embedded mode, so the host, in this case, is uh, localhost 9984. So I'm telling this solar, when you start up, talk to that zookeeper, and it will basically give you your instructions, right? It doesn't quite work that way, but bottom line is, you're gonna be in solar cloud mode talking to this zookeeper. Console messages aren't important. Same thing, 8986, this is my third node. Talking to the same zookeeper. And I sure hope I ran my reset demo command. <laughs> uh, okay, and then finally the fourth node on 87. Okay. So now I'm gonna go over to my trusty solar console and when you're, when Solar's in cloud mode, it activates this cloud link here, okay? Um, there are no collections yet. We haven't dealt with that. I'll deal with that in a second. But what's interesting is actually in this tree mode, a couple of things. So now we're sort of looking at um, the data that's inside Zookeeper, okay? Uh, one of the ones that's sort of interesting here is this um, live nodes, okay? so. One of the things, and I'll talk about this in a second in more depth, Zookeeper sort of keeps track of which no nodes are live in the cluster. In this case, we see our four that I started. That's great, it's working so far. Um, and then there's some other Z nodes in there that we'll talk about, but for now, let me go ahead and <clears throat> I'm gonna run a script that comes with Solar, and this is uh, the ZKCLI script, and it's sort of a set of tools uh, that, that do various um, utility things, and for this, I'm going to upload a configuration file from my workstation into Zookeeper, so a set of configuration. If you remember, I said a collection has a configuration, so I'm gonna go ahead and upload that up into Zookeeper. And let me refresh, cool, so config, so I named that logs, and those basically are the configs. Now any collection that comes along that decides it wants this configuration, it can just say, I want the logs configuration. So one collection could use it, a hundred could use it, okay? <clears throat> so now let's go ahead and create a collection, and I'm gonna call this collection log stash for solar, and this is essentially the same command I had on that slide. 
Replication factor two in num shards two. That looks good so far. Okay, so this little panel here is the graph panel, and what it shows is your collections, sort of their topology. We have two shards, and then the nodes, okay? All are green, that's great. So we have four nodes, um, two shards, and replication factor of two. The little black dot, that's indicating the leader, and I'll get into what a leader is for now, but um, basically every shard has a leader and any number of replicas after that. So that looks great. Let's now use a little utility um, to index some synthetic documents into the, this little solar uh, log stash for solar collection. And again, notice I'm talking to Zookeeper, and we'll see how that uh, plays out here in a second. And actually, let me just verify that. Sorry, the resolution's a little off. Okay, so numdocs, okay, we're all good. Let's start indexing. Again, the console logs aren't really important. This tool just sort of uh, fires up, connects to Zookeeper, um, and then starts indexing some synthetic docs in there. And you can see it's, it's doing its thing. So now let me actually go <clears throat> over here and notice that uh, 8986 is our leader for shard one. I'm gonna go kill that. Okay, so that's dead. N nothing. Okay, so now let's go back. Notice Solar Cloud has said, well, that guy's gone. Gray is gone. But our indexer is still over here working. Okay, so we just saw how the, the cluster had a leader. We were indexing. <clears throat> there might have been a little hiccup, a little pause here, whatever, but the bottom line is Solar Cloud gracefully fell over and selected, who is it? Uh, 8984 is the new leader, new black dot, and kept on trucking. That's awesome. Let's go ahead now and bring that node back up. Just restart it. This node's gonna come back up, talk to Zookeeper, decide, okay, now I'm a replica of shard one, and uh, I've been offline for a while, so I'm out of date, so I need to catch up, okay? So now, basically, um, there's a whole lot of catch up and uh, indexing uh, sort of recovery going on right now. If we go back to Solar Cloud, we can see that node is back online and happy as an active replica, okay? So now let's do another thing, which is super cool. Let's do some queries. Since we've been, um, sorry, the uh, resolution's a bit off here. Okay. Uh, let's see, how does one do that? That was an unforeseen thing of the, uh, of the demo. What's that? Oh yeah, thank you. See? Okay, so let's zoom back in. Um, okay, so basically now we're querying. Um, that's not all that interesting. One thing that is interesting that I wanna show you is this um, debug equals track. It's fairly new. I think it's new in 471. Um, and actually, let me do this. I'll shut off the rows just so we can see that information. But it actually gives you really good information about what shards were hit and what they did and kind of how many documents they found and that sort of thing. Um, and so when you're working with Solar Cloud and things aren't quite right, this debug track is, is really interesting. So that was a quick demo. Um, we could sit here and play a lot and play around, but I think you get the idea that you know it's pretty easy. Bring up some nodes, create a collection, index into them, that kind of thing. <clears throat> okay. Cool. Okay. So I've talked about Zookeeper. Let's dig a little bit into more of what Zookeeper is all about. Um, Key takeaway, since this is an introductory talk, I'm not gonna get too much in the mechanics of Zookeeper and things like that. Um, 
if you're a student or at all interested in distributed systems, I highly recommend like going to the Zookeeper site and like researching it and, and learning about it. It's a really awesome technology. In the solar cloud space, Zookeeper's job is to essentially um, kind of provide a lot of uh, services, if you will, and we'll, and we'll see kind of some of those in, in behind the scenes um, that don't really belong in solar because it's really just about managing the cluster state and and sort of um, coordinating nodes and things like that. And really, I think this might even be Zookeeper's tagline is that, you know, uh, clusters are a zoo. You know, that's really where it got its name, Zookeeper, and that kind of thing. So uh, as we saw as part of my demo, uh, one of the things it did is we uploaded this configuration up in Zookeeper. <clears throat> if you think about that, uh, that's pretty awesome because uh, when a node joins the cluster, it now, you don't have to worry about putting files out there, or SCPing or anything, right? The nodes go out to Zookeeper and pull their configuration, okay? Um, and so uh, that kind of begs the question of, all right, well, now I want to may maybe change some of the auto commit settings, for example. That's a very common solarconfig.xml uh, change. How do I do that? Because now the solarconfig.xml is in Zookeeper. Turns out that you actually you make the change locally you have to push it back up into Zookeeper, and then you have to tell, using the Collections API I mentioned, um, Collection, all your replicas, go out now and actually pull down that change and reload yourself, okay? So that's sort of how configuration management works in, uh, in Solar Cloud. Just know they're in Zookeeper and you have to uh, essentially make your changes there and then reload. <clears throat> Another very key thing that Zookeeper provides is sort of cluster state management. Um, one of the ones is, is live nodes, and I showed you that. So um, it's pretty important in a cluster that you know which nodes are up and which nodes are down. Remember, I killed 8.6. It was gone. Zookeeper knew that. Well, that's a very important thing if you know, because you don't want your queries and your indexing to continue to try to hit that and have to sit there and suffer uh, timeouts, connection timeouts and whatnot, right? So it's a pretty important thing to know your live nodes. Um, it's an interesting question is, how does Zookeeper know when a live node goes down? Right? We saw that. Uh, it knew it very quickly. Turns out, and this is, again, why I think it's awesome that Solar Cloud is built on Zookeeper, is because Zookeeper is built for this sort of thing. And it has built into it this concept of an ephemeral node. So when a server comes up, a solar server comes up, it creates this Z node in Zookeeper. And then it, try, and it has to like keep that node alive through the Zookeeper client API, right? And if that server stops keeping that node, that ephemeral node alive, boom, Zookeeper says you're gone, right? And it may be, uh, it may be a temporary, like a full GC pause, or it may actually be the disk crashed or a network partition or whatever. But Zookeeper is built around this whole concept of knowing which uh, nodes are live, okay? Uh, another thing it does actually is um, as you saw, we had two shards and, and uh, two replicas in each shard and that kind of thing. So there's metadata about each collection and where each replica lives, which node and that sort of thing. All that is maintained in Zookeeper. So again, if one of the replicas are offline, Zookeeper keeps track of that. Okay? Um, another very awesome thing about how Zookeeper works is that <clears throat> when you're interested in some state that, Zookeeper, that is stored in Zookeeper, you can register as a watcher. And in this case, all the solar cores that are participating in a collection register as watchers of that cluster state, okay? And so when there's a state change, Zookeeper pushes out, and it does this very efficiently, uh, and notifies the watchers that there's been a state change. And that's important because, uh, for one, maybe uh, uh, one of the replicas that a leader is indexing to is, is offline. Well, that leader should probably know about that pretty quickly. So it's watching for that cluster state change, and it gets that through Zookeeper. And then lastly, leader election. And I'm going to talk about leaders in a second, but uh, it's a sort of a built-in sort of recipe behind leader election. And a leader, for without getting too de technical, is like just some role that uh, it's a special role that <clears throat> you want it to do some work. Uh, like one designated node to do some work, um, you can use this zoo, uh, this Zookeeper leader election recipe. Let's talk about that. 
Okay. So keeping with our log stash for solar, I use two shards, maybe 10 shards appropriate. So this kind of question is when do you shard and how do you decide how many shards? Um, the, the bottom line is that's kind of up to you to decide. Um, a, a couple of things that are important to know. One is, um, again, collection has a fixed number of shards. So once you build that collection and start indexing in there, if you want to change that number, say you, say you start with six and you decide, oh, I really should have seven, um, that's not going to work. So um, we'll see how shards can be split, but basically you're sort of stuck with that number uh, up ahead, so you need to put some thought into it. Um, let's think about some ba basic ideas. When we're indexing, okay, um, I can have an index client come in and sending documents into shard one and two in, uh, concurrent. So I can send documents to one and two at the same time. So right there we see that really sharding uh, is a great strategy for actually getting more concurrency in, during indexing and queries, okay? Um, so that's really sort of the justification for sharding is taking a big index, splitting it in, into different shards to, get, to sort of increase your ability to do more concurrent work uh, during indexing and query execution, okay? And there's actually some data partitioning strategies and things like that, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Um, when to shard? Well, if I have queries that, you know, I have 10 million documents and I have queries that, you know, end up sorting millions of documents, uh, it would be actually very useful to have that large collection split up. So if you have a large number of docs, sharding is, a, you know, definitely a strategy you want to look at. The other is like large document size. If you have these huge documents, um, again, parallelism might help you there. So it's not a cut and dry answer, but I think honestly in this day and age of big data and things like that, you're probably good to just plan that you are going to do some sharding. You don't have to, you can just have one shard in your index, but uh, for the most part I think the, the benefits of sharding definitely outweigh the costs. <clears throat> okay, Let me take a quick sip. I tend to talk loud and Lose my voice easy. Um, okay, so now that we've sharded, we have to decide how documents get placed in those shards. And that's what Solar calls document routing. Um, if the, well, yeah, let me actually go with this. Okay, so in this example, every shard has um, a set sort of a hash range that it covers. And as you can see here, I have two shards, and the shards have their hash ranges. So it's a 32-bit integer hash range. And so the default document routing strategy in Solar is to take the document ID during indexing, uh, run it through a hash algorithm, and then map that to the shard range that covers that document, okay? Um, That's out of the box. You don't have to do anything other than supply a document, a unique document ID uh, for each document when, uh, when you're indexing. I'll we'll cover custom hashing in a few slides, which is actually uh, kind of gives you some influence. If you were here for Chris's talk, basically you can decide, well, um, I want all of my, and since we're talking about log stash here, um, I want all of my MySQL log messages to go to the same shard because it's a common use case for me to actually query just for MySQL and do that kind of thing. So you can have some influence over that. One of a, it's a relatively newer feature is actually give you some uh, tri-level routing um, capabilities. So in this case where maybe you have like a real multi-tenant type of application um, search index where you're keeping uh, data for applications, users, and then docs. So that's a pretty flexible tool. I think it's more of an advanced thing, so I won't cover it too much. And then also, if you decide that sort of the hash-based rou uh, routing thing isn't, isn't right for your application, you can actually use implicit, which is basically the shards don't have a hash range, um, and you're now responsible in your application for deciding where documents go, okay? And a good example there is like, uh, time-based partitioning. Again, I want my January logs in this shard, my February logs in this shard, March, etc. Right. So that um, that comes up a lot in sort of date date-based partitioning. Okay. So um, 
distributed indexing. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Sort of the key takeaway is that in Solar Cloud, uh, it provides a smart client called Cloud Solar Server that has the ability, and actually my demo use this, go into Zookeeper, determine who the shard leaders are for your collection, and then actually index directly into the shard leaders. So, and it can do this in parallel. So if you give it a batch of 100, it can actually split that batch up and send the appropriate docs for shard one into shard one leader and the appropriate box uh, docs in the shard two uh, leader, okay? And it can do that at the same time. The leaders themselves actually then uh, do the work of distributing those docs to the replicas, okay? And it actually does that if we had more than one replica, it would send those docs at the same time to the replicas and keep track of you know, who acknowledged the right and that kind of thing. Um, and the other thing here is that when the leader receives a doc, it actually indexes the, the document into a file called a transaction log or a, in a, in an update log. So it ensures that when it receives uh, an update request such as an index a doc, uh, it gets pushed down on durable storage right immediately, okay? So that's how in, um, distributed indexing works. Spoke a little bit about a leader. Let's, let's kind of dig into what that means because uh, I think it's important that there's some confusion around that. Um, first off, leaders aren't master nodes. There's no master slave. In this case, the leader has a, a few additional responsibilities during indexing, okay? Um, leaders can also handle uh, queries. And when a leader takes in a query and executes it, it doesn't have anything special about it. It's just another replica from the query perspective. Um, one of the things the, the, the leader does is it actually, all update requests for a shard have to go through the leader. Um, and one of the jobs it does, it actually adds a version on the document. So every document is versioned in Solar Cloud. Uh, and that actually helps support some, some of the features around like optimistic locking and things. So um, uh, I won't actually talk about there that may be covered in other, in other talks. And then also the leader's job is obviously to send updates such as index docs onto the replicas and keep track of if that worked or not. Okay. <clears throat> so this kind of raises a question is, you know, why does Solar Cloud need a leader? You know, why did it, why did we decide on this design? And for me, it thinks, I think it's because um, you kind of want, when you're indexing, you want to ensure that all the requests go to the same node that is kind of keeping track of versions and all that, that it's not this scramble. So that goes back to the, the, the simplicity part of the architecture is that leaders really help simplify a lot of the um, kind of complexity of indexing documents because all documents go to the leader and then it does the job of doing the replication, okay? Um, and then lastly, if the leader, as we saw in the demo, happens to go away for whatever reason, then Solar Cloud has the ability um, automagically <laughs> to fail over to a new leader as we saw. Okay, so we've talked a bit about sharding. Now, one of the other key areas in Solar Cloud is replication, okay? Um, the reason we replicate are, are two reasons, mainly. One is high availability. We wanna have extra copies of our documents in case we lose a server. Uh, the, essentially, there's, uh, we're ensured that there's, those documents exist somewhere else in the cluster and so we're not losing data, okay? And the other is sort of query load balancing. Um, you, you, you pay the cost a little bit on the indexing side in that you have to replicate to more copies, right? You have to create more copies and more disk and all that. But on the query side, now you can support uh, more clients querying because you have, say, for example, with a replication factor of three, you have three copies. So three different servers can service the same, same, not, you know, same query to return those documents, right? So you get higher query throughput, especially when your queries are like complex faceting and sorting, things like that. It's great to be able to load balance and distribute across those. A couple of things that are, I think are important about solar cloud replication is that it's, uh, it's near real time. So when a uh, index doc comes in and hits a shard leader, it gets passed on to its replicas, you know, almost instantly, right? The leader 
sort of validates it's a good document, persists to its transaction log, and then sends that on to the um, to the uh, sorry to the replicas. And the the reason that actually works, or it was chosen to do that way, is to actually support near real time search. And again, I think that's part of sort of the architecture we're seeing a lot more of is that people want their data available, you know, within seconds of being indexed and things like that. Well, uh, back before we had Solar Cloud, we had master slave based replication, but it, it had to replicate entire segments. And you can't replicate entire segments in a few seconds unless you want real, you know, thousands of really small segments. So uh, Solar Cloud's replication model is really sort of founded in this concept of, of, of being near real time. And then, um, you know, um, I don't know if Mark, yeah, Mark's still, I think he's in the room. But um, the error handling around this sort of replication model it actually gets really tricky because, you know, the, the leader has to say, uh, oh, wow, I'm replicating the, to, this, um, to this replica here and it's not responding, you know, what do I do? Uh, and so there's actually a lot of really interesting error handling uh, um, situations around this replication model. Uh, and... Uh, Solar has sort of built in, as we saw, I brought that node 8986 back up. It realized it was out of date with the new leader and recovered itself and that sort of thing. So all that sort of built into Solar Cloud's machinery to, to replicate and recover off of the leader. <clears throat> okay, distributed queries. Uh, I'm getting short on time, so I won't spend a lot on the details here. I think the real key takeaway, uh, again, with Solar Cloud is... Uh, if you have an existing solar client application that sends queries, it doesn't have to change. The whole distributed mechanism behind the scenes uh, is really sort of hidden to the client, okay? Uh, behind the scenes, it's sort of a two-phased, uh, you have to send the query into one of the nodes, and again, leaders don't matter here in distributed queries. Leaders only matter on the indexing side. The uh, query comes into any node in the cluster, which I'm calling the query controller, and then it does this sort of two-step two process to one query all the, all the other replicas uh, across the collection so that we query all the shards, bring those results back, and sort of come up with the, the uh, set of documents that are ID'd uh, to satisfy <clears throat> essentially uh, the, the one page, you know, like a client requests a page, and then it does a second step to actually go out back to the replicas that are involved in this query and pull the document fields, right? So uh, the first step, I get the score in any sort fields, and then the second step, I go and finish um, building out the, the rest of the documents. And when I showed, and hopefully I can do that really quick, uh, the debug track now. So if you do this debug equals track, you'll actually see some of the evidence of this two-step process and the querying of the IDs and that kind of thing. So that'll give you visibility into this distributed query process. Okay, so in Solar Cloud, and this is again more of an advanced thing, but I think it was it was useful to sort of mention it is that um, there's a special role, and there's only one of them in a cluster. It's called the overseer, and its job is really to sort of execute some sort of cluster-wide type operations. One of those being, say, um, create a collection, right? So that that you can't send that to a specific collection, so the overseer handles that, and uh, it bases its work off of um, uh, using Zookeeper as a distributed queue, okay? And so some of you may be thinking, well, this sounds like a single point of failure. And in reality, uh, it, it is a single thing in the cluster, but as with shard leaders, the overseer is also a leader. It's a, it's a special role that gets elected uh, through leader election in Zookeeper. And if it happens to fail, that node that's running the, the overseer goes down, then it will actually automatically fail over to another node. And since the actual work tasks are persisted 
in Zookeeper, the new one can take over where the last one left off. Uh, mentioning the, the overseer because uh, in really large cl uh, clusters that we're, um, that we are um, uh, sort of testing out right now, we're, we're seeing some areas where the, the overseer kind of needs to be improved and scaled and things like that. So this is an area of active improvement. Um, for the most part, it works really great, especially in kind of normal size clusters. So, <clears throat> okay, um, it would not be a good <laughs> distributed system talks without at least mentioning CAP. Uh, and for those that aren't familiar with the CAP theorem, I'll just summarize it quickly. Essentially, uh, it's a theorem that says a distributed system should adhere to three basic properties, consistent, available, and partition tolerant. Um, but in reality, uh, you really get to pick two of the three at any one time. Uh, since the cap has come out, we've all kind of learned that that's a, it's slightly more nuanced than that, and that's where you hear about systems like Cassandra, which is eventually consistent and those kind of things. Um, at the bottom of the line, since it's a solar cloud talk, uh, we won't get into the theory of cap so much, but basically solar cloud favors consistency. Um, and when you say that, it's because, first off, partitions are essentially kind of a given in our world, right? It could be a network partition, it could be a disk failure, whatever. So we're really talking about a system has to kind of be partition tolerant, so it's kind of a de decision between consistent uh, or being available. Um, and in reality, a distributed system always has to be consistent, or why the heck would we use it, right? I mean, at some point, consistency is the most important thing when it comes to data systems. So uh, the point is, what do you sort of have to give up to ensure consistency? And some systems, again, like Cassandra, sort of say, well, um, just throw writes at me. I think some recent benchmark Cassandra is like a million writes a second, right? Uh, well, I've seen some of Cassandra's repair models, and they're not seconds. <laughs> so basically what Solar has decided is that consistency is very important in the search engine. And so what it gives up is that it has to at some point push the fact that it can't write a document um, in order to sort of maintain consistency. It has to push that back to the client and say, look, I can't take your write because um, right now I can't, I can't remain consistent. Um, and the bottom line there for the day-to-day -day application of this is like to index a document, there has to be one active healthy node per shard, okay? Um, and what we're kind of learning, and there's some work in, involved here, is that actually um, that may not even be good enough. That if we have a replication of factor of three, we want to make sure that actually the document uh, gets accepted on two of the three replicas. That doesn't exist today, but it's sort of planned and we're working out some of the, the ideas there. Um, but the bottom line is, and this is just me learning and running a cluster, is it's really hard to fix consistency issues in a search engine like Solar. Uh, so it's important that it remains consistent. Um, really, you know, a lot of the times when, when if a replica was to get out, out of sync with its leader, you end up killing that replica and making it basically snapshot pull the whole index uh, to get reconsistent. So um, bottom line is that solar essentially, if it can't maintain consistency, it doesn't play any games like, oh, hey, I'm shard four, shard five's down, let me take in docs and hold them for shard five until it comes back. It doesn't play any of those games, there's no read repairs or any of that stuff. Uh, bottom line is that the, the, the right has to exist on um, on one healthy shard, or it will fail and push that back to your client. Um, I've sort of touched on all this. This is just more of a recap. Let me, um, getting short on time, probably have about five more minutes, so uh, may not have time for questions. But um, So we talked about custom hashing. Here's a really good example. So with our, with our uh, log stash for solar index, remember we're aggregating log messages from different applications, for example, MySQL, or in this case, at Apache Web Server. Uh, the idea here is that with custom hashing is you can influence which shard, um, and actually if you ran that, 
value through. I don't know if it would map to shard one or two. I didn't test that. I should have. But the bottom line is that you use this sort of shard key prefix, okay? And then that will route into shard two or this, the appropriate shard. What it ends up uh, allowing you to do is to end up have all your Apache messages in the same shard. Um, one of the things is that, and I didn't, I kind of gloss over this, but with the default um, document ID hash uh, that comes out of the solar, you end up being very, ba you know, almost balanced between all the shards. They all have the same number of documents. With this type of approach, a couple things can happen. One is shard two can end up being uh, a lot bigger than shard one, okay? Um, and the other thing is like, you can end up kind of having you know, all your MySQL and all your HCBD and Collecti or whatever all go to the, you know, the same shard. It doesn't quite work out that, but you end up with more imbalance in your cluster. And again, the idea there is that you want to kind of co-locate documents that have a, some, some common property. That's the shard key. And in this case, it's, you know, the app they're coming from or whatever. Um, the other example I liked was like sports, and sports are seasonal, so you know you can kind of keep all the, the golf in one shard, and then you can scale that up for queries and things like that uh, during golf season, or you know uh, we're ramping down on basketball season, so you can maybe uh, sort of reduce the number of nodes you're dedicating to basketball queries and that kind of thing. So that's really what custom hashing really allows you to do, is to sort of give you a lot much more control over um, where documents are going in your index. Okay, so as I mentioned, especially with custom hashing, uh, shards can get too large, right? And if we're doing the balanced approach of default document routing, uh, then pretty much all your shards are gonna be the same size. And so if you ended up wanting to split to grow your index, you'd probably have to split all those and add new nodes and that kind of thing. But Solar supports that. So the idea here is in this, in this example, uh, we've decided we want to split shard one. It's just too big, okay? And so shard one's range is that. Shard splitting, which happens behind the scenes, is a collection API command. It essentially tells Solar Cloud, go ahead and now make shard one into two different sub shards that have uh, basically half of this original range, okay? Um, and for the most part, that's a pretty seamless operation, except when this split happens, um, and maybe this has changed, but I, I think it's not, is that you actually, to really get the benefits is you're gonna have to pull these guys off, right? The split shards off onto new hardware. Otherwise, you're just sort of splitting shards, but you're not adding any new system resources and that sort of thing. So you really have to migrate those. Um, and th there are commands in Solar with the uh, core API and collection API that you can do that. <clears throat> Okay, lastly, and then I'll stop talking. This is, this is another thing I think that's really cool about Solar Cloud, and it comes in very handy uh, from an operations perspective, but it's the use of this collections aliases, okay? Uh, and in this example, what I'm doing is I essentially have my log stash for Solar Collection, but I'm reading, I'm executing queries through this alias, this read alias, okay? And then I have my indexing clients down here indexing, and ignore that arrow for now, into this through this alias, okay? And what that affords me is if I decide, oh, I need to change my text analysis strategy, I need to re-index or whatever, is that actually I can redirect to a different collection and start writing and not affect my query side, okay? And then you can see where I'm going with this is that when this is done, this is your new index. You can actually just update. It's an API command to, to reroute the query to the new collection, okay? And so uh, it's one of the things that I think it's like, it's often overlooked. It's very simple, but it's very powerful in the, um, in the uh, sort of operation side of Solar Cloud, especially if you can foresee we may want to re-index down the, down, you know, down the road, uh, you, you can, Sort of plan, plan ahead by using these collection aliases. <clears throat> okay, so other feature highlights, and I have one minute. So, uh, essentially, 
Solar Cloud supports near real-time search um, and optimistic locking. These are things to look at if you're interested in. Uh, recently, HTTPS, I'm pretty sure Mark's going to talk about that in his talk. And then uh, HDFS and MapReduce, also probably in Mark's talk. Um, okay. So I'll be around for the, constant, uh, for the rest of the conference, and I actually have a talk tomorrow, so just grab me if you have other questions, but I don't want to hold people up from lunch anymore. So. Thank you. <clears throat>